when the heart is full, as Nesta Mingwe says, the lips will be silent. And my heart is full today. After having seen the visual marvel of uh, Army University's journey, I would say it's a saga from a humble beginning. The epoch making sacrifices made by it had made this institution a young institution of so many decades because it's only human beings who become old but not the institutions. Institutions will always continue to be young. One thing I can share with you, in my parent university, I'm called R.V. My name is R. Venkato. <laughs> most of the senior professors used to call me R.V. And therefore I became a bit sentimental. Well, okay. The two alphabets. <laughs> but such a lofty introduction was given about me. I was immediately reminded of food the notoriety of the legal profession. Basically, I'm a lawyer. Okay. The notoriety arising from the fact that when the case is weak, the lawyers give a long introduction. At least to impress upon the client who is the paymaster. But when the case is strong, they just get up and say, my lord, the facts speak for themselves. Maybe such a lofty introduction was given about me. Maybe because the case is not very formidable. Okay. Don't have high expectations about that. Because as the economists say, when you have rising expectations, you have that at this point in Isn't it? But the scenario we the Indian education system is also that the standards have not fallen, but the expectations have gone up. That's the position, see. Standards have not followed, standards have gone up, but the expectations have been up. And expectations have been going up to such an extent that no less a person than Barack Obama, my younger brother, who is the vice president with Wiplo, has sent me the recorded speech that Barack Obama made in Seattle when he was seeking office for the second term. Barack Obama is a professor of law and he was referring to the Silicon Valley being called the IT capital of the world. But then he said, you fellows, till yesterday IT used to stand for information technology, but now IT stands for Indian talent, he said. Amazing talent. Because be careful about two youngsters from two nations in the world. And normally he said, when I say two nations, Americans have phobia about China, everything they will refer to China. Don't think that China is there because China is not a young nation, it is a geriatric society because of the skewed population policy that was observed during the height of the Cultural Revolution when the couples opted either for no child or for single child. And therefore, for every youngster, you have at least half a dozen elderly persons, he said. Therefore, Obama said, when I say youngsters from two nations, they are from South Korea and India. And they are aspirational. And they are not prepared to settle even for the second best. They want better than the best. And that's the reason why I say IT stands for Indian talent. Then the author Gurucharan Das, some of you must have heard about him, a prolific writer. Right. He wrote a book, India Grows at Night. And in that book release function, I was on the dais with him. In two book release functions of Gurucharan Das, I shared the dais. The first one was The Difficulty of Being Good in 2009, The Subtle Art of Dharma, where he makes a comparison between modern Bharat and Mahabharat, okay. 
and says, Ambani brothers fought with each other because Mahabharata said brothers can fight. Therefore, don't blame Ambani brothers, he says. And Gucharan Das wrote a book, India Grows at Night. And he was sitting next to me. I said, Sir, why did you give the title India Grows at Night? He said, Professor Saab, have you read my book? I said, I have read almost all your books, including this. Don't you think that I have given the title India Grows at Night? Maybe because the government would be sleeping at night. <laughs> but then he said, I told you in a lighter way, why I'm saying India Grows at Night is, what is night time for India is daytime for Europe and United States. And all of our qualified engineers from the reputed institutions and professionals, they travel all the way to United States and Europe and they contribute to the growth of the world. And they come back now, they are coming back now, he said. And therefore I said India is growing at night. And in that he says, where Barack Obama said IT stands for Indian talent, I would say IT stands for India tomorrow. And that India tomorrow you will be dealing with it. Because we in the university campuses deal with the so-called I generation, internet generation, which is born between 1995 and 2012. They are born into social media, they are born into smartphones, they are born into internet. So, now, about their cognition capacity, technology has an impact. But what impact does it have on the emotional equilibrium of the youngsters? This needs to be understood here. Psychology is here, no, isn't it? What is the impact on the emotional equilibrium when you speak about robust curricular development, okay? Be that as it may, it's a privilege for me to have been called upon to interact with you because I, for one, believe that significant innovations always take place because of synergies and symbiotic relationship and not because of lonely genius. And I have come here today to learn from you and to give something from my side. It's a mutual process because when we expect the students to go back from the classrooms wise and not otherwise. Remember, a teacher should basically believe that he should be a lifelong learner. And when I look at the faculty development program, my mind goes back to, he was referring to Sitaram Yachuri, one of the extraordinary lectures that this nation has produced. Sitaram Yachuri was the president of Jawaharlal Nehru University Students Union. When I was present on that campus for my research work. And that afternoon I still remember a teacher from the discipline of history was being felicitated because he got a prize which was equivalent to Nobel Prize. As you know, Nobel Prize you don't have in all disciplines. And he got a prize just like our Sierra Rao, who got a prize equivalent, just 102 years young Sierra Rao, you know, person. And so like that, the history teacher got it. And he was being felicitated at about 3.30 in the afternoon. So like an inquisitive young man, I barbed into the room where the function was being held. Remember, it was a function where a teacher is being felicitated. There was a big banner. A big banner. Upper half was open, lower half was covered. So it was something like an Arthasatya. Okay. And the upper half, which was visible to the naked eye, it said, We don't want learning teachers. We don't want learning teachers. I was too young to understand the implication of that, but I knew the JNU people would always have a trick up their sleeves 
so that I curb my curiosity. The meeting started, ritualistic items, introduction, finished it, etc., etc., and the teacher was about to be finished speaking, he was asked to take a seat. Then they removed the wheel from the lower portion also. Then the whole inscription went, we don't want learning teachers. What we want is learning teachers. And our teacher is the best example of a learning teacher. Faculty development program focuses on that. Because a teacher needs to have three important qualities. He must be a lifelong learner, a frontline researcher, and an eternal problem solver. He must be always a part of the solution, never a part of the problem. Okay. And these three qualities a teacher has, and, and that banner got embedded in my memory. Four years after that, when we invited Justice Krishna Ayer to Andhra University, he started on a similar note. He said, judges and teachers never retire, they rarely die, because they influence the eternity, he said. They never retire, they rarely die, because they influence the eternity. But the problem is, People refer to us as a learned judges. And when somebody refers to you as a learned judge, don't take it as a compliment, he said. He's, the other fellow is saying, oh, you fellow, you have become formalized. Remember, you have become anachronistic. You have become out of circulation. And therefore, you must be a learning judge and not a learned judge. And the teacher should be a learning teacher. And when you speak about curriculum, because a teacher would continue to command the respect of a student only as long as the student realizes that a teacher is also a student. The moment a student realizes that a teacher is trying to bank on his past, Remember, youngsters believe in the fundamental management dictum that an achievement becomes meaningless once you achieve it. Remember, till you achieve it, well, you have to go. But it becomes meaningless once you achieve it. <coughs> Therefore, if you want to command the respect of a student, you must be a continuous student. And that's the thrust of the faculty development program. And it's my privilege to be associated with you today because today is a very significant day. 26th April is World Intellectual Property Day. Please remember that. World Intellectual Property Day. And India today is an intellectual powerhouse of high voltage. There is no doubt about that. Alvin Toffler in his book, Power Shift, makes an observation. If 19th century was ruled by Great Britain, the sun did not set in the British Empire, that's what my history teacher taught me. But Toffler says, you know the reason as to why the sun did not set in the British Empire? Because the sun was afraid it would also be colonized. Therefore, the sun was keeping itself awake. And because uh, Napoleon Logico said they are a nation of shopkeepers. Okay. And therefore the sun did not set in the British Empire. But if 19th century was ruled by Great Britain, and if power has shifted in 20th century to the United States after its accidental entry into the Second World War, thanks to Pearl Harbor attack, to whom will power shift in 21st century? Alvin Toffler in that book, Power Shift, says power will definitely shift from the United States in 21st century. It's the first step in the place. Then he says, will it shift to Europe? In 2009, 2008, look at the wonderful research made by Alvin Toffler and Madame Toffler. 
They predicted that power will never shift to, to Europe because Britain would always be suspicious of the moves of Germany and would never allow Europe to become strong. Exactly three years ago, that's what had happened. The aftermath of Brexit. Okay. And therefore, if power doesn't shift to Europe, will it shift to Middle East? You had petrol dollars at that time. Alvin Toffer says uh, it will not shift to be leashed because uh, if you look at the evolution of mankind, three M's have dictated the growth of this. First is the muscle power, law of the jungle, where you had place only for the lion, not for the lamb. Okay, that's the first capital M. Then muscle power gave to money power. And 21st century is that century where money power is giving to mind power. So the evolution is from muscle power to money power to mind power. Therefore power will shift to those countries where you have knowledge. Ultimately, Toffler says, all distinctions among the human beings, excepting that of male and female, will disappear, excepting that of knowledge haves and knowledge have nots. This is ultimately going to be the journey. Knowledge haves and knowledge have nots. And you will have abundance of knowledge haves in the Asian continent, both in China and in India. But China is an aging society. Age is still a dividend in India. Matthew used the word carefully, still. Remember, we may fast run out of that if we are not judicious enough. Okay. Therefore, since you have the demographic dividend in India, power will shift to, in all probability, in 21st century, to a knowledge hub called India. He says. And if power were to shift to knowledge hub called India, you don't have a magic band of Aladdin overnight, okay, or opens the same formula where you can do it. It has to be nurtured and nourished in the classrooms. Remember. What happens in the classrooms today would ultimately remember, result in the deferred dividend called the growth of a nation. And that's where you would be required to play a very important role in curriculum development. But then the other aspect is as I already told you, we have to deal with I generation market very carefully. And youngsters of I generation deal more with machines than human beings. Very interesting aspect. They deal more with machines than human beings. In fact, Thomas Friedman, in a book, Thank you for being late. I don't know how many of you have heard of it. It's a masterpiece. Please read it. Thank you for being late. Yes. He speaks about structural maladjustments of the aging human beings. When they feel that they are not able to cope with the exponential changes that are taking place in technologically driven society. For example, I'm now 69. I'm when this iPhone was presented to me by my grandson for 96 hours, I was at my wit's end. And it was my grandson who is hardly nine years old taught me fundamentals. And gradually, because God has given us the capacity of Darwinism to adopt ourselves, remember, I cease it to be uncomfortable with it. I don't say comfortable with it. This is what exactly Thomas Friedman says in thank you for being late. That means uh, don't get panicky. In due course of time you will get interested. But in that he makes a reference 2006 was a fantastic year when the Android phone was invented. It brought about a total revolution. Right? And today's youngsters uh, they deal with machines. 
Here one important point please remember because there are people from other disciplines also. The fourth industrial revolution is not a product revolution, it is a systems revolution, unlike the earlier three revolutions. The first revolution, the second revolution and third revolution, they are product revolutions. Okay. The fourth industrial revolution is a systems revolution. You have robots, you have artificial intelligence, you have internet of things, right? And here, let me still some time to say, one of the finest definitions of artificial intelligence I have not come across in a computer science book. I was a judge in a debate competition for school going students in Bombay. A little angel came and said, artificial intelligence means an attempt to mechanize human thoughts. That's all. An attempt to mechanize human thoughts. The whole <coughs> all clapped. Such simple definition, no more. But then she said, can all human thoughts be mechanized? Finish. In two sentences she explained the whole thing. Artificial intelligence is an attempt to mechanize human thoughts. Can all human thoughts be mechanized? This is what exactly Klaus Schwab in his book Fourth Industrial Revolution asked. Klaus Schwab is the president of the World Economic Forum at Davos. Wonderful, guys. So you, can, you have some response from the body language of the student. The teacher gets enthused, you know. Klaus Schwab is the president. He says, what is required at the end of the fourth industrial revolution is a new human renaissance success. Why? A robot can replicate your brain, but it can never replicate your heart. It can never replicate your soul. A robot can never replicate your heart. A robot can never replicate your soul. And therefore, while taking advantage of robots, while taking advantage of artificial intelligence, be judicious enough, says, that there is a dawn of a new human renaissance at the end of the fourth industrial revolution. What was Upendra Bakshi calls, let us not become post humans in the 21st century. Are we still human beings, especially still human rights, you understand? Or are we living in a post-human world? Why I'm telling this is, remember, no gadget can substitute the radiance and warmth of a teacher in the classroom. Please remember that. My professor used to say those were the days of overhead presentation, OHP. Okay. Yes. And my professor used to say, teachers who do not have anything over their head, they will come with overhead projectors. <laughs> and when from OHPs we move it to PowerPoint presentations, he used to say, what a student expects in the classroom is a powerful presentation and not a PowerPoint presentation. Because he found youngsters consuming time in the classroom by reading what is there in the PowerPoint presentations? He used to say these PowerPoint presentations are meant for teachers of science and technology who otherwise would be required to waste time in drawing the diagrams and circuits of the board. To save that time, you have a PowerPoint presentation. But the younger generation is falling into the trap of reading syllables from the PowerPoint presentation. And once you fall into the trap, it is entering the dragon. You cannot come out of it. And therefore, the focus on powerful presentation used to say, and they used to beautifully say, recall the words of Steve Job, who said, how happy and peaceful was life when apple and blackberry were just fruits. <laughs> how happy and peaceful was life when apple and blackberry were just fruits. 
Bill Gates, taking a cue from that, said, I must compliment Steve Jobs because today we are dealing with the younger generation and they are asked anything about Windows, they will be showing Microsoft Windows, not the natural Windows which will show you the information. And then they speak about, even under the Negotiable Instruments Act, remember, RFC, easementry rights in law. When you talk of Gates, they will talk of Bill Gates, not of natural Gates, right of assets. So this is a very dangerous trend, he said. Because when you're speaking about curriculum development, please remember, today's younger generation, in the name of connectivity, is the most disconnected generation. Are they connected to the internal self? Please remember that. A teacher in the classroom is supposed to do that. Remember. Connecting him with the self. Remember. This is very important. Otherwise, what would happen? You would have academic excellence without human excellence, which would be disastrous. Please always remember, academic excellence without human excellence is disastrous. I know my students from National Law School of India University writing passionate mails to me, saying that if slavery exists in 21st century anywhere, it exists in the claustrophobic spaces of the cubicles in corporate law firms, they said. If slavery exists, <coughs> it is in the cubicles of the corporate law firms. And you know, they said, sir, please give us a recommendation letter so that we will apply for master's program and get into this corporate culture. At the age of 27, 28, where are we heading? When I was referring to YSR Murthy's statement, this is a small presentation. I said, small is always beautiful. That the title of a book written by Schumacher in 1970s, for which he got the Nobel Prize, where he advocates that the only solution to the evils of the hedonism coming out of the materialistic civilization is to go back to Gandhian way of thinking. Yes. Because he said, small is not only beautiful, small is also beautiful. And one striking sentence he says, Occidental world is a fast moving world going nowhere. There is no destination for it, he says. And beautifully, Indian philosophers say, if the Occidental life culture speaks about lifestyle issues, the oriental culture speaks about lifeline issues. But, and when you are speaking about curriculum in the classroom, please don't miss the wood for the forest. By yes, technology is absolutely essential, no doubt about that. You need to teach artificial intelligence in the classroom. But there has been a lot of emphasis on what? We teachers of law also, we teach students to ask only one question, is it legal? We never ask them to raise a question, is it right? There's a lot of difference between these two. Is it legal and is it right? Because I ask them, if the function of law is to secure the desirable behavior, and prevent the undesirable. Why has law failed to secure the desirable? And why law has failed to prevent the undesirable? Ask for yourself the question. Is the part with law? No. The inherent limitation of law is it cannot regulate the greed of human beings. Now it can instill character in human beings. Can law do that? Our psychologist would say, when I speak about Freud's emotional insanity, 
our moral insanity and structural maladjustments between the social institutions and the individuals because they feel alienated. That alienation resulting in frustration. That frustration manifesting in aggression. And that aggressive behavior being called criminal behavior. Yes, it is very easy to say he is a criminal. But are we forgetting the fact that society is preparing the crime and he is committing it? Because of the structural knowledge. Why I am telling you all these things is when you look at curriculum, please remember the cardinal duty of a teacher. The cardinal duty of a teacher. I have committed this mistake in my first part of my career. Most of the youngsters also will be committing the same mistake. But that Bernard Shaw said, wise people learn from the mistakes committed by others. Fools who do not learn even from their own mistakes. To which category we belong, we should understand. What was that mistake? Andhra University was the first university to have started the semester system in law in the entire country. And 14 weeks of instruction, 12 weeks of instruction followed by examinations. So every day, alternate day, we used to have examinations. And as youngsters, our primary concern was how to complete the syllabus. You agree with me? Which cannot do injustice to students, okay? Therefore, take extra classes, Sunday, and complete the syllabus. But later I realized that the job of a teacher is not to cover the syllabus, but to uncover the syllabus. to remove the color of darkness from ignorance to knowledge. Bible says co-values from here to eternity, from darkness to light. So you must awaken the curiosity of the young mind when you speak about robust, he has used a very interesting word, robust curriculum. Okay, a robust health robust mind, okay, and in that robust curriculum, remember, evaluation is also a part of robust curriculum. Only one question I would like to ask you, before, because, are you making our students learn things with pleasure or under pressure? Please ask for your question. In my last school, students used to get mentally disturbed also sometimes. They used to say, sir, we are stuck with the so-called deadlines. For everything there is a deadline. And are we missing the wood for the forest by saying that in education institutions, deadlines are the lifelines? Are the students becoming clogs? See, just start for yourself. Learning with pleasure and not under pressure. Can a young teacher take a class with a smile on his face? Or is he going to the classroom under pressure? Waiting for the bell to ring at the end of the 55th minute. For whom the bell tolls? That's what one thing is. Like, our robot saw this HK block bell, that bell. Okay. So, can the teacher take the class with a smile? Exchange ideas like this. Okay. Now, that is what you mean by robust curriculum, in my opinion. In one particular seminar, a suggestion was made. Can you take the student, take the examination with a smile? How much pressure, if you are looking at the incidents in IITs and other things, apart from remember, structural maladjustments, how many precious young lives we are losing? How many dropouts are there? What will be the contraindication? And somebody asked me, Sir, he had become a lawyer. And I practice in criminal law. 
The first thing that I am made to understand in a court of law is examination of the accused. When the accused comes, you examine him. And during my student career, you said examination of student. Is there any difference between student and accused? You asked me. <laughs> Look, examination of the witness. I've used the word test. That it means a testing time. Can you have a better word in place to test the knowledge quotient of the student? Because this is the place where you have innovative ideas. Please remember. <coughs> Everybody is calling examinations. Try to come out with the innovation. Because this is an age of innovation. I always tell my friends, the acronym of life in 21st century, you must understand. And the meaning given to the word innovation by no less a person than Satya Nadella. He said, look at LIFE, learn innovation forever. That's the meaning of life in particular sense. Because we are not living in the age of renovation. Yes, true. But Sachin Adela said, innovation means empathy turned into action is innovation. Empathy turned into action is innovation. He was referring to Mother Teresa's quotes from my side, and I'm very passionate about that, he said. I remember one line from his speech, always. Passion for what you do, and compassion for whom you do. How many of the teachers have compassion for students? Remember. A student would fall at your feet the moment he understands that you are trying to mentor him. Mentor him means you look at him with your heart, empathy. We maximum we stop at counseling. Counseling means see some difference in humanity. There is lot of difference between counseling and mentor. Okay, be a mentor and. That will have a salutary impact on the student. So, in the age of the fourth industrial revolution, when you are dealing with I generation students who are the most disconnected, what is most important is that human touch and the ability to teach the elementary principles that <coughs> what we require is human excellence in you, incidentally academic excellence. See, fundamental duties in the Constitution of India say to strive towards excellence in both our individual sphere of activities and collective endeavors so that the nation rises to highest levels. But what do you mean by excellence? Is it excellence in the product or excellence in the human being? Anti plagiarism software is metaphorically called turn it in. I think most of you must know it. Yes. yes. That means you have to turn it inside you. What plagiarism from without? Saying that 30%, what 30% is will mean? That means up to 25% you are entitled to copy? As somebody said, if a student attends classes for 75%, he can appear for the exam, and that means he is given a right not to attend 25%. Correct now, notwithstanding incentive marks for attendance. So 30% plagiarism stops means up to 30%. You can do it. That means selective copying at a limited level, you can do it. Turn it inside. Integrity is doing the right thing when nobody is watching. Have we ever told 
these principles to them. Why did the phenomena called the phenomena of Rajat Gupta happen in India? A copyright law teacher, when he teaches in the classroom, this law. Rajat Gupta was a famous IIT Delhi alumni, did his master's in business administration from a reputed business school in the United States. He was in the page three circuit of Hollywood, not Times of India. Attending dinners in White House. He had a beautiful wife and a couple of children. Yet he fell for the bite of insider trading. And he was constrained to cool his heels inside US jails. A book came, Rajat Gupta, R-A-J-A-T. There's a book also called The Fallen Angel. And that too from Mackenzie. Yes. Yes. How do you explain that phenomenon? What a fall from sublime to abysmal depths. Why did it happen? That's the reason why I said the ethical perspective in curriculum. Every subject needs to be taught from ethical perspective. Please remember that. Not a separate paper in law called professional ethics. That's a ritual to fulfill the mandate of the Bar Council of India. No. So, the, right from the moment you enter the classroom, remember, because the classroom is the most sacred place, more sacred than the altar of God. There must be a total transformation in the personality of a teacher. And when he speaks about, remember, the curriculum, I tell you, Archibald Wheeler, famous physics professor from the University of Pennsylvania. He was also a Nobel laureate. You know, if you go to University of Pennsylvania, if you go to a canteen, you'll be having a cup of tea. There'll be three Nobel laureates also having a cup of tea, informally sitting. Somebody will tell them these are all Nobel laureates. I was shocked with Bermudas and others. And that Atman Velal was asked a question. Why do students exist in the universities? After long interview, the last question was, Professor Wheeler, why do you think students are there in the universities? You know, the answer given by he said, to teach professors. Beautifully <laughs> said. To teach professors. professors. And he gave the example of Amatya Sen. Amatya, even today, before he publishes his manuscript, circulates it among his students in the classroom. And only after he gets a lot of approval from all the students, then he presents it to press. Otherwise, he'll throw it in the dustbin, it seems. So that is the content. And here we are to ignite the spark and wings, to give wings to the fire. Okay? Therefore, discuss everything with ethics, from the ethics perspective. Because these are the peculiar nuances of the 21st century. Technology, at the same time, we should not assume Frankenstein proportions. At this stage, I'll make it more specific to law for just 15 minutes, okay? Before we have a dialogue, okay? I brought three books. The Lawyer Bubble by Stephen Harper. In fact, I'll do one thing. Now, can you circulate this list of books to students, to our colleagues? I noted down the names of five books. Okay. These five books are Tomorrow's Lawyers by Richard Suskind. Then The Lawyer Bubble, A Professional Crisis in America. Then, the most important book is Failing Law Schools. That's the title book by Brian Tamaraha. I'll tell one or two instances on this book, you'll be shocked. Then, again by Richard Suskind, The Future of the Professions. 
And then tell the kids online quotes. You okay. Can we circulate them among you? The question that is asked here is he speaks about the crisis in legal education. And very interesting. Today in the United States, a very peculiar incident happened two years ago. Law students, after graduating from the elitist law schools in the US, top law schools, they could not secure placements. But it's America, it's not India, please. Here we keep quiet. What they did was, after walking out of the university into the universe, when they did not get the jobs as their deans have promised, they filed a suit for damages against the universities, saying that the universities have cheated us. The universities have made us to take hefty educational loans, promising that we will be getting the American dream fulfilled. And two years have passed, three years have passed, we have not got jobs. And these deans of law schools, for the sake of inflated rankings in the law school rankings, in America, law firms and law schools, their rankings have commenced from 1985. And since you do not have the concept of a secure permanent employment in the United States, remember, unlike India, okay, all deans will be on the Remember, toast. Because unless they deliver, their job will not be renewed. So for these deans have started making false promises, coming out with false data, so that their rankings will go up. All artificial, even the complaint in Daily Ganesh and I are also. Now, fudge the data. And the students file the suit for damages. Of course, the suit was dismissed, but the judge said, this needs to be examined seriously by all the stakeholders, students, parents, especially teachers, as to why this phenomena is happening now. Okay, if it was yesterday in America, I'm sure in another five to ten years it will be definitely in India. Where, remember, the law schools, so-called law schools, have already come up to 27. Okay. Then you have excellent private institutions outside law schools. And there are 1,700 law colleges inside the country. As to what is going to happen. Now, what is that we are teaching here? Even in England, Richard Susskind, in his book, says, Tomorrow's Lawyers, are we teaching 19th century and 20th century to law students? Or is there a place for 21st century in law curriculum? First point. And he says, unfortunately, not even in one law school in England, there is place for 21st century curriculum in law schools. Professors still teach 1970s law. They refuse to come out of the threshold of tradition. This is what he uses the word. And in 21st century, the concept of lawyering and legal profession would undergo a total transformation set. Some of my colleagues from departments other than law, you will be surprised. Today, you don't require a law degree in England to practice law. Legal profession has been thrown open to other professions. That vision, the distinguished alumni of IIT Kharkapur had when he started that intellectual property clause in IIT Kharkapur. Where you have today chartered accountants, 
computer engineers, doctors opting for that three-year LLB program in intellectual property. So the next question that comes to our mind is, apart from the popularity of the five-year law course, is there a need for us to introduce the three-year law course whereby you can make doctors, engineers, chartered accountants do law? Because in 21st century, please remember, I will read out as to what, will, what are the openings of lawyers. It is just mind-boggling. For the first time when I read, I couldn't believe it. Yes. In 21st century, you will have a legal knowledge engineer. First job. Then legal technologist. Then legal project manager. Then legal management consultant. Legal risk manager. Legal health care manager. And tomorrow, the employers will be, for lawyers, global accounting firms, high street retail business, legal leasing agencies, online legal service providers, legal management consultancies. Just to give an example. And he says in 21st century, the focus would be on not a dispute resolution. We teach in the class today, ADR, alternative dispute resolution, negotiation, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, and adjudication. But this is all only dispute resolution. But in 21st century, the focus would be on dispute avoidance, legal risk management. This is a subject that's going to work. Are we teaching that in law schools now? Today we teach law in such a way that even when he becomes a litigating advocate, it will be solo advocacy. That means I'm an advocate, my client comes, I discuss something with him. And today in the India, you know, in some cities, you will be shocked to know top advocates, like a physics student, they have a stopwatch with them. Mr. Vaisal Muthi comes to me. He starts discussing with me. I switch out my stopwatch. Initial reading, 11.45 time. Okay. He completes his submissions. The time will be 12.25. My charges are per hour 50,000 rupees. You have spoken especially by law firms. And today, the entire legal profession in the United States is controlled by 250 law firms. It's in the grip of the law professions. India, the same scenario is happening. Because up to 1990s, law firms were only family firms. Only family members used to join. But today, thanks to globalization, open, and I will not be surprised if like United States, remember, all law firms start controlling the entire administration of justice apparatus. To what extent is it desirable? Now these are the issues that are being discussed in law schools in America now. And even in the subject called professional ethics, now have professional ethics been drafted keeping in view the corporate lawyers. Look at it. Professional ethics. Professional ethics, traditional litigation advocacy. Even the 184th Law Commission report, which speaks about skills in legal profession, it speaks only about skills of a litigating lawyer. But that jamana badal gaya, that those are gone. Litigation advocacy is only a minuscule thing today. And Richard Suskind predicts the day of a solo lawyer is over. 
you will be having hybrid lawyers in 21st century. They will be management expert. They will be civil engineer. They will be lawyer. Because infrastructure contracts will play an important role. Now, therefore, if we have an eye on 21st century for robust curriculum development, please remember, teach 19th century and 20th century, don't stop it, he says. The core subjects need to be taught. Contracts, law of thoughts, principles of liability, they need to be taught. But you should not stop there. And here, let me humbly submit, in fact, uh, Vaisal Muthi was telling that uh, <laughs> your institution is awaiting formal recognition from the Bar Council of India. I will do my best because I am a member of the Legal Education Committee. Thank you, Very soon we are going to have the meeting, okay? And immediately I will give a phone call to you, send it, everything done, okay? Thanks. Okay, and but <laughs> apart from that, most of the law students and law teachers have a complaint against the Bar Council saying that the bar council has prescribed these subjects, sir. Okay, major subjects, minor subjects, all sorts of things. But let me tell you, bar council does not impose any factors on your unlimited imagination. It only says these are the papers to be taught, but it never says that you must stop here. Please remember that. You cannot escape teaching those papers which have been prescribed to you by the Bar Council of India. They are called core subjects. But beyond that, remember, tomorrow suppose you would like to see genetics and law. That's the very important area, please. DNA, engineering, okay. And this is called hybrid law. So, young my friends, see, people like me, because this is IPL season, cricket. We have, I have started my second innings in a five-year test match. But you are yet to face the first ball in an unlimited test match. So, don't follow that fundamental principle of money in economics. New coins drive old coins out of use, correct? If you become a bad coin, you will be driven out. And therefore, if you don't look at curriculum with an open mind and teach the students what they require for 21st century, they will become hopelessly outdated. So 19th century teaching, 20th century teaching must be transformed into 21st century. And he gives an example. With that, I will stop the discussion. He says in America, in three law schools, how innovative subjects they have introduced. University of Miami. They have started a subject called Law Without Walls. Like medical medicine without 40 years, you must have heard about it. They have got awards also. Law Without Walls. Now, this is an exciting part virtual, part physical. International initiative that aims to change the way that law is taught and practiced. The whole course is as to how to teach law. How to practice law. The focus would be on management, the focus would be on engineers, the focus would be on philosophers. Ethical input. Remember, all these things, and they raise a very interesting question. When I was a student of law, one favorite question used to be, law is not a business or trade, law is a service. Right? But in 21st century, can we continue to use business in the pejorative sense? You say commercialization of medical education. Is commerce of such sinister significance? Can the world exist without international trade? People are now asking. So, in England, a group of scholars have emerged who said it is legal business and not legal service. It is a legal business, business in a positive sense of the term. Remember, therefore, but still we have a hangover. 
we call it the uh, moment commercial we call it uh, we call business in a pejorative sense okay and people say you are business like that form should we get rid of that corporates i'm this is what you mean by the robust curriculum development please remember that in business law you are specialist in corporate law okay business law means you are like a businessman the end justifies the means okay no there are canons of ethics there therefore what is that we are quite into so okay and now the scenario is moving to that play stage where the court is no more the sun place it is a service online dispute resolution mechanisms and virtual courts it is going to be the reality in the 21st century today you have only selective application so when you speak about robust curriculum development please think about these things and come out with innovative ideas and the last point i want to tell you is before the, please read a very interesting book yes now why i am suggesting this is the ultimate fulcrum of robust curriculum development is the individual teacher in the classroom i'm sure you are all the school of law you affiliated to all the university only na so there are two separate institutions are we sort of legal studies is a separate entity yeah. and the school of law will be based in the university itself yes now They're both two separate ah, because the i understand because you have kataraka state law university concept also yes, so the army of legal studies is affiliated to ksl okay, so there you don't have that autonomy i understand that but make this an autonomous one okay where three things you must remember please read a book most of you must have read it daniel pink his book that title is dry d r i b e dry dry by daniel pink in that book he mentions three points to retain interest and motivation okay first is autonomy now india is very peculiar even in center state relations when you speak about autonomy okay states want autonomy but the so they state don't want give autonomy to municipalities you agree states feel that center is not giving them autonomy but they don't want to give autonomy to municipalities municipalities will not be prepared to give autonomy to, to democracy at the grassroots that means autonomy only to my level that you should when we say autonomy teachers should have autonomy students should also be given equal autonomy please remember that because cardinal principle of teaching is never limit the unlimited imagination of your student because of your limited imagination never limit the unlimited imagination of your student because of your limited imagination likewise never impose the limits on your unlimited imagination because of the limited imagination of your peer group have you understood so for that you require an open mind so when i speak about autonomy to the teachers it should not mean the autonomy should stop at your respective cubicles just as you expect autonomy and as far as framing of a syllabus is concerned by philosophy teachers should be given absolute autonomy within the prescribed norms let that syllabus be placed before the academic review committee of the college where all of you will be members you discuss 
you come with the innovative ideas that is absolutely required for motivation motivation at your level and motivation at the level of students so the first one is autonomy the meaning of autonomy is you should have the control of your decisions and goals having control on your decisions and goals is called autonomy it cannot be imposed from above number 2 mastery you must attain mastery and for any process to be enjoyable you must be good at it okay so you must always remember the dictum in war there is no place for runner up in war in war only winner gets it okay okay the third principle is purpose this is very very important and you must try to work for a purpose greater than yourself have you understood that means you start with a very humble goal all of us are human beings therefore we are selfish that we tell you none of us is in martin luther king mahatma gandhi gautam buddha or mother teresa but the first principle should be have enlightened self interest have enlightened self interest that's what i mean when i say purpose and the purpose should be greater than yourself okay when you prepare the syllabus okay now in some of the american schools it will be put in public domain and shared with the students and the feedback will be coming from the students that these areas are not relevant for us sir okay open discussion okay this can be substituted by that give that try okay initially there will be layers of resistance for any change there will be layers of resistance even the body okay you will overcome the layers of resistance incrementally if your conscience is clear mahatma gandhi says where your conscience is clear all elements in nature will conspire to help you and if your conscience is not clear all elements in nature will conspire to stop you with a clear conscience keeping in view the paramount welfare of the student because the member ultimately speaking we are not the first to be born we are not the last to die we are players in the relay race required to hand over the baton to the posterity without allowing the baton to fall down and somebody god has saraswati had blessed us with the opportunity of being teachers in the classroom okay so at beatles song says in 1960s i'm a favorite buff of beatles one of the favorite song says don't let me down <laughs> okay that's what the young student says don't let me down because as a young mother when she sent her child to the kindergarten and nursery so she am why is that was telling the toughest admission for him was to get his daughter admitted into a school nursery nursery school <laughs> now she is a proud student of finally almost in general law school see when the tiny tot goes to the school and comes back okay while giving him amul's prayer food you will say what is that you have learned in your school today okay that she will show so many new things because for the tiny tot the teacher is the wisest person under the sun if you say something she will say mama you keep quiet my teacher has said this because for her and that because for the student remember a teacher is the be all and end all okay therefore don't let them down give a robust syllabus and curriculum which is in tune with the needs of 21st century because please remember you cannot have solution to 21st century problems with a 20th century mindset and 19th century working tools
to you the one but that. And you must have open mind. And you must have humility. What do you mean by humility? Philosophers say display of modesty and absence of arrogance in humility. A teacher should have that quality. Display of modesty and absence of arrogance. Okay, be modest, be prepared to learn from your students, give the best so that the surrounding around us will become more safe and more secure. Thank you very much for having given me. Thank you, sir, for your wise and insightful words. Sir, can we have a round of questions? Of course, why not? So you have given a very rich affair uh, with each, uh, uh, what you call, the message, so powerful, like purpose. Purpose itself is a, uh, and then the purpose should be higher than one's own self and then about the curriculum, you have gone to such basics, particularly about the 21st century, this thing and the note teaching 19th century and having a, uh, it's very difficult for me to uh, really de uh, describe or and you know the richness of each of your messages and uh, now the floor is open for Q&A. You know the one standard joke, how intelligent and smart would be the students I'll tell you. In the beginning I said, when the heart is full the lips will be silent. And this is a quote of Ernest Hemingway. And I used to tell my national law school students this. And that's so brilliant. When I used to conduct Viva for them, they used to say, sir, my heart is full, therefore my lips will be silent. <laughs> <laughs> I said, this, that is a beautiful way of expressing what I said. <laughs> so, therefore, don't penalize yourself if you cannot live to that because our hearts are full, they used to say. See, that is the intelligence of students. See, you look at they, see, as to how they, that is what you require. Okay, the positive aspect, okay. That means uh, all students, please remember, that are equally brilliant. And other quality that you should remember is no student is a problem, but every student has a problem. Please remember that. Just like for a mother, no child is a problem, but every child has a problem. And the mother looks at the problems of her children from different perspectives. Agree? Likewise, a student teacher should look at a student. That empathy, remember. And once you have that empathy and you discuss with them, hundreds of students have shared their personal problems with me, including their failed love stories, boyfriends deserting them, parents acting as stumbling block, because they see a human being in you. Ultimately, see, education is not information. It is formation. Formation of a complete human being. And as Vivekananda said in one context, that which bridges the distance between a human being and being human in education. That which bridges the distance between them. And most important thing a teacher should remember is, teachers are like water purifiers. Only the muddy water comes here. Don't expect pure water here. You are here to purify that water. Keep it in the desiderator. Okay. Filter those things. Make it pure. So that it becomes portable for the society. Have you understood that? Therefore, never complain. Okay, about the students. You are playing the role of a purifying center. Okay. If you have that, remember, you will definitely go down to the level. That's what I said. Compassion for whom you do. This is very, very important, please. And that's the reason why any job has working hours but not teaching. 
Nothing like syllabus, nothing like curriculum. You must travel beyond that. Okay. You teach it. That's the most enjoyable aspect of teaching job, most formidable aspect of teaching job also. Because you are a role model for the student all the 365 days and 24 hours. How you are behaving while you are boarding a metro train, the student would watch it. How you are dealing with the railway portal, he would watch it. And he would start imitating you. Therefore, that is so it's a continuous, ongoing exercise, okay? And those are the contours of the curriculum, okay? I be an ideal teacher, okay? And I always pray the Almighty, if I ever have one more life, I must become an elementary school teacher where you can teach fundamental lessons to youngsters. In fact, I'll tell you, two of my national law school graduates, who were, that was a couple, they, they were classmates, they fell in love, they got married, they started working in a corporate firm, each with a salary of around one crore. They got so fed up, they resigned their job and joined a school as a teacher where their salary is 45,000 rupees a month. And both of them said, we are very, very happy now, sir. Our health is fine, we have, we have no stress, and we are sharing everything with our youngsters. They are in Bangalore, they are teaching in a school with a salary of 45,000 about four years ago. It must have come to 55,000 or so. Okay, teaching seventh class, eighth class students in a private school. And that's where you are. Because money is the fringe benefit of the job you like. Please remember. Always remember that. Both values you must inculcate. Thank you very much. Sir, with your permission, the room is now open for questions. Yeah, please, please, please. Thank you, sir. That was very inspiring. And uh, you actually preempted my first question, which was about asking about uh, the level of the students in the classroom very quick. You actually answered it. And that comes only after teaching so long, you almost preempt the question, sir. Uh, that, that I realized. Uh, what I wanted to ask you was about the curriculum design itself. Often, when I'm designing, we have autonomy here. In RV, we are given total autonomy. And I'm running a course called India Studies, which doesn't have a precedent. So I can do what I want with that course. So uh, when designing the course, I always am worried whether there has to be a breadth of subjects or should I just take one topic and go depth. So this breadth versus depth, always when I'm designing the curriculum, sometimes I feel I have to go depth, like take one book and go exploring a vector till the end of all this, or take all the nationalists and do all of their political philosophy. And then even when you do that, because of this semester system, we have this two holidays comes, two, two thinkers are out. So, how do we uh, rationalize the depth versus breadth for ourselves in the curriculum design? I know the ones that are compulsory, the topics are given by the institutions. But for example, if I'm designing an elective for them, where would I pitch my, what would be more useful do you think uh, a depth curriculum would be useful for law students or would it be uh, breadth? I would focus only on depth because even where an institution has a constraint, of not being allowed to design a course because of, uh, no problem, that's it, okay. <laughs> See, I was giving the example, last school we affiliated to Karnataka State Law University, they may not have much freedom. Even in that, you add a value added course. And it must be remembered the area of operation should be as small as possible and go to the depths because that will awaken the curiosity of the mind. See, the objective of education is to awaken the curiosity of the mind. Now, the more broad the spectrum, there is a danger of we missing the wood for the forest, number one, and generalities will always mean peripheral and superficial discussion. Okay, see, instead of discussing all the 18 Ajayas in Mahabharata, take only one stanza. Discuss in depth about that. You did it. Because as Vyasa in Mahabharata, you know, very, you know, youngsters, we call Ganesh the first stenographer in the world. Very interesting. 
when Vyasa was asked to compose Mahabharata, which is an amalgamation distilled wisdom of all five Vedas, Vyasa said, I will do it, but I become too old, I cannot write it. I need a stenographer. Then the story goes, God said, this mischievous fellow called Ganesh will be your assistant. Okay. And Lord Ganesh said, I will agree. Only on one condition. The old man should continue to discuss, dictate. If he stops dictating, I will go away. Have you understood? As long as he continues to dictate, I will take it down. Continues. Then Yasa said, I accept your condition. But my condition is, you continue to write only as long as you are able to understand the meaning of the stanza and discussing, dictating. <laughs> Once you are not able to understand, you put down the pen. So whenever Yasha wanted to take rest, he used to dictate a difficult stanza. <laughs> Lord Ganesh used to put the pen down. He used to recharge his battery. That difficult stanza you take, madam. Discuss it in depth. Okay, that is the object of education. Okay, right. Because it must be a lively place, I'm telling you, classroom, because please remember, youngsters, we speak about research. Teaching is dissemination of knowledge, but research is creation of knowledge. Okay. And the best place for creation of knowledge is the classroom. Please cultivate one habit. After the class is over, for 10 minutes, you write a resume of whatever has happened in the class today. 